Week 1. Unit 1. Exercise 1. Until at least the early 2000s, the World Wide Web was a rapidly evolving space, but one with a chronic problem. It was an ever-expanding repository of information with no efficient search function. In 1994, the editors of Postmodern Culture, one of the first academic journals to start publishing on the web, were concerned enough about this new medium to warn their readers that venturing onto the web, which had grown from an estimated 100 sites in June to over 600 sites by December 1993, may result in a kind of informational vertigo. While this warning may now strike readers as extremely funny, it is worth noting that for much of the 1990s, finding anything on the web was a problem. It would take nearly a decade for this problem to resolve. As search engines were refined and became more functional, however, the drive to game the system also increased and more individuals and organizations started to produce content for the web that had one sole purpose, to rank high in any search. So-called discoverability came to dictate why a lot of content was being produced. Exercise 2. A particularly revealing excerpt illustrating the importance of written documents is provided by a remark made by Socrates. Socrates was an important philosopher in ancient Greece who was not at all interested in keeping written records of his thoughts. In a dialogue with a young student, Phaedrus, Socrates recounted how the god Toth of Egypt offered the king of Egypt all types of inventions, including dice, checkers, numbers, geometry, astronomy, and writing. The god and the king discussed the merits and drawbacks of the various gifts and were in general agreement until they reached the gift of writing. Whereas the god stressed the advantage of being able to remember information, the king objected, if men learn this, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they will rely on which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. From the remainder of the dialogue, it is clear that Socrates wholeheartedly agreed with the king of Egypt and thought that the availability of books made students lazy and discouraged them from properly studying. Exercise 3 the history of ethics is largely a history of the development of two central lines of thought, one that emphasizes our fundamental duties to others, and the other that strives to justify decisions based on the effects that our actions have on others. Immanuel Kant, William David Ross, Sela Benabib, and others argued that the most important question to pose is whether a person understood and was attempting to carry out a moral obligation or duty. If so, the outcome of one's action has no bearing on whether he or she acted ethically. Their duty-based or deontological approach is focused almost exclusively on intent and is the only way they argued to acknowledge the existence of universal moral obligations and to assess one's moral character. What makes a lie immoral, Kant said, is not the consequence of the lie, whether it prevents embarrassment or results in serious harm. A deliberately told lie is wrong because of what it is, not what it does. By its nature, a lie is an assault on our human dignity. 
We are failing morally if our intent is to deceive, and whatever results from that deception is immaterial. Exercise 4. The communicative relevance of algorithms is actually related to their independence from understanding. We are facing a way to process data and to manage information that is different from human information processing and understanding. My assumption is that this difference is not a liability, but instead is the very root of the success of these technologies. Just as human beings first became able to fly when they abandoned the idea of building machines that flapped their wings like birds, digital information processing managed to achieve the results that we see today after abandoning the ambition to reproduce in digital form the processes of the human mind. Now that they no longer try to resemble our consciousness, algorithms have become more and more able to act as competent communication partners, responding appropriately to our requests and providing information neither constructed nor reconstructable by a human mind. Exercise 5 Social cultural evolution provides some reason to suspect that a stable population, which sounds so good to most people, would deprive human culture of its greatest single source of dynamism, population growth itself. The origins of agriculture, agricultural intensification, political evolution, industrialization, all appear indebted to population growth. However, Population growth's role in a few major cultural transformations of the past does not mean that it is essential for all culture change. It scarcely seems likely that people would stop seeking better cures for disease, for example, simply because population had stabilized. Furthermore, the absence of population growth does not necessarily mean the absence of population pressure. Indeed, Thomas Robert Malthus believed that populations, when they do stabilize, tend to do so at a level too high to be easily supported by existing resources, creating constant pressure for culture change. If he was right, then even a population stable numerically is inherently unstable culturally. Exercise 6. Restoring a river in order to recover a species, whether salmon in the Columbia River Basin or any other species in diverse ecologies around the world, require drawing from expertise across many fields, from engineering to biology to ecology to geomorphology. River restoration is about more than just fixing a broken stream. It also involves everything that connects to that stream and the organisms that rely on it. In this case, the endangered salmonids as they move throughout their complex life cycles. When people in the field refer to the work of restoration, they are usually casting a broad net. They may be including riverside and streamside habitat, the wetlands and forests, and estuaries that salmon pass through at different times in their non-ocean lives, as well as the stream morphology, the arrangement of rocks and debris that force the stream to move in a particular way. Restoration, therefore, also covers the geology of the river itself, along with the flow of water, the element that is most often in greatest need of being restored. As one restorationist said, their job is to recomplexify a simplified river. Exercise 7. Eating offers pleasure at the risk of future pain. This obvious truth holds today more than ever 
with our increasing ability to detect and identify foodborne illnesses. Well-publicized outbreaks of cholera and salmonella have made people aware that foodborne disease makes a lot of us sick every year. An estimated 76 million illnesses annually in the United States alone, with over 300,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths, imposing an estimated cost in the tens of billions of dollars. For example, Jean C. Busby and Tanya Roberts estimated that for six bacterial pathogens, the costs of human illness are estimated to be $9.3 to $12.9 billion U.S. annually. Of these costs, $2.9 to $6.7 billion U.S. are attributed to foodborne bacteria. One estimate suggests that one out of three consumers in industrialized nations suffers from known and newly recognized foodborne diseases each year. And if we look globally, we might also note that hundreds of millions of people around the world fall sick as a result of consuming contaminated food and water. Children under 5 still suffer an estimated 1.5 billion annual episodes of diarrhea, which result in more than 3 million premature deaths. Exercise 8 The need to contain cost is a major driver of globalization. Firms are encouraged to expand beyond their home jurisdiction in order to capitalize on low-wage rates in other countries. A significant number of North American and European companies, many of them well-known manufacturers of branded consumer products, have elected to move their manufacturing operations to China in order to take advantage of that country's low-wage structure. Clothing and shoe manufacturing firms have been producing in China for many years, but so also have companies in other sectors such as consumer electronics, food, and industrial products. While China's wage rates are considerably lower than those in Western industrialized economies, they have been rising significantly in recent years. This has prompted some companies to seek out even lower wage jurisdictions from their manufacturing operations, and interestingly, has also encouraged American firms to move production back to the U.S. Exercise 9. Our reliance on networked information to assess job candidates will only increase as algorithmic tools become more sophisticated and less expensive. Today, human resources rely on big data, the collection and analysis of massive databases of information to identify job prospects. Analytics firms crunch data to search for and assess talent in particular fields. Remarkable Hire scores a candidate's talents by looking at how others rate his or her online contributions. Talent Bin and Guild create lists of potential hires based on online data. Big-name companies like Facebook, Walmart, and Amazon use these technologies to find and recruit job candidates. Will algorithms identify targeted individuals as top picks for employment if they have withdrawn from online life? Will they discount online abuse so that victims can be evaluated on their merits? One can only guess the answers to these questions, but my bet is that victims will not stack up well next to those who have not suffered online abuse. Exercise 10 Although it was rare, some ancient philosophers took exception to the view that women were complete subordinates. Around 532 BCE in Croton, a beautiful and prosperous seaside city located in the toe of southern Italy, Pythagoras founded a school of philosophy devoted to mathematical and theological insights. Women were allowed to study, 
and teach in the school. Pythagoras and his followers postulated that women were men's intellectual equals, in that the two were capable of friendship. Nevertheless, from what remains of their writings today, it seems they didn't want to shake things up too much. Men and women studied separately, and but for the few in Pythagorean schools, the rest were to carry on with their traditional social roles. What's more, the friendship that brought the sexes together required women's obedience. A harmonious asymmetry is how the Pythagoreans liked to think of it. And in the case of marriage, as one ancient historian put it, Pythagoreans held that wives were not to oppose their husbands at all, and that wives would achieve a victory if they gave in to their husbands. Exercise 11. Definitions of what a career is are changing. Historically, a career was defined by upward mobility and advancement in a steeply graded hierarchy, achieving greater responsibility and influence, with the vast majority of employees remaining with their organizations for life. Career success was measured by objective criteria such as pay, status, and power. Today, a career is more likely to be defined as a long series of work experiences, with job movements being upward, sideways, and, in some cases, downward. Termed protean careers, career success is increasingly measured by intrinsic criteria, such as satisfaction, engagement, meaning, learning, and growth, rather than external criteria such as income and organizational level. More people today want to trade money for meaning. Sheryl Sandberg views careers today more like jungle gyms, structures allowing movement from one rung to another rather than as a ladder. Exercise 12. In the past, it was always a safe assumption that the expanding marketplace would consume everything that was produced. As a consequence, the primary goal of a company was to produce in the most efficient way and distribute products to the market. However, the old view that a business makes products and then sells them within the supply chain is no longer so relevant or valid as businesses have come to realize that they can lead a horse to water, but they cannot make it drink. In the future, companies cannot sell products anymore. People will buy from you. This means that the old concept of being supply-driven, company pushes products to the market, is being replaced by a pull concept, the market pulls goods from you where a company understands what their customers need and works backward, deciding how it can satisfy that demand by developing new capabilities. Thinking about business from the outside-in perspective, in other words, being demand-driven, is mainly a customer-centric view, where organizations no longer have a sales focus, but a buying customer focus.